sound is back on sound. Jeff Maestri is Professor of Linguistics at UCT and holder of the Saatchi Chair on Migration, Language and Social Change. Among the positions that he has held in the past are Head of Linguistics Section at UCT, President of the Linguistic Society of South Africa and Editor of the, public, the journal Image Today. <coughs> he holds an A rating from the National Research Foundation in the field of linguistics and social linguistics. This is the highest rating you can have as a researcher. Mm -hmm. Professor Red Maestri has written and edited 16 books which, in the, which, which, which are in the areas of social linguistic theory, English dialects in South Africa, learning of African languages, and Indian language in South Africa, including a dictionary of South African Indian English, published by UCT Press. Next year, as president, he's running the International Congress of Linguistics so, um, thank you very much, Midi uh, Roll, for that uh, elaborate introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a great uh, honor to, to speak in front of a general audience rather than to reluctant undergraduates. And uh, to give you an inkling of some of the, one of the many hats that I wear, and one of the hats that I wear is indeed an Indian hat or a South African or Indian South African hat. And I thought I'd share with you our ongoing research on migrations under colonization and their sociolinguistic effects from India to South Africa. <clears throat> and uh, after many years, I'm returning to this theme uh, to earn my living and, frankly, to uh, kind of do my duty for education in South Africa. I've put aside my early doctoral and postdoctoral research interests, starting in KwaZulu-Natal, to do things that resonate more to encourage research in a, a different environment, a national kind of research at Cape Town. So for years, I've not done much 
on Indian languages. But in the last couple of years, I've uh, entered with a joint project sponsored by the uh, Institute for Humanities in South Africa and the Indian Council for Science, Social Science Research. And I'm delighted to say that the partners on this research are almost all here. Professor Nolkul Karni is out here from Deccan College, Pune. Uh, Ruta Paratkar, her PhD student, will be known to quite a few of you, but she's uh, in India at the moment. I have Drs. Vinu and Brunal Chavda from Gujarat University, who started two months ago researching Gujarati, the history of Gujarati in South Africa as a linguistic entity and a literary language. We have Nazira Mohammed, my MA student, working on Konkani and vestiges of Konkani amongst young people. Okay, I thought I'd give this slide early because one usually runs out of time at the end and the sponsors are usually not amused. Okay, so let me say uh, that my discussion today is going to be in the field of sociolinguistics, i.e. we are interested in ordinary people talking in ordinary ways about ordinary things in ordinary languages and in many languages, okay? So we have no uh, predispositions as to what is really good language and what is high literature and so on. We are interested in ordinary people talking on a daily basis. And there, there are many hidden histories, uh, life stories that are told that are often forgotten when language gets put on t to the written word in books by educated people, that people from from below, ordinary people have amazing stories. And as linguists, we chart those stories out from the very languages they speak, the way they speak, the accents they have, the grammatical predispositions, the discourse modes, uh, the proverbs they come up with uh, and invent on a regular basis, and so on. So you will never hear words like good and bad language for me. All language is great for me. In a linguist garden, there are no weeds. They are only wonderful flowers. Now, my theme is about uh, Indian languages in South Africa, but this is a fraught country. One must always be careful of being seen or thought or mistaken to be reinventing the apartheid wheel or the wheels of ethnicity and separateness and so on. So although I'm pretending that Indians can be conceived of as a homogeneous group for our purposes for the next 45 minutes, uh, the truth is this is a convenient fiction, all right? All groups are fictions and overlap, and especially the boundaries are not at all rigid. In fact, I would say if you think of Indians as a large number, mostly starting off in Durban and KwaZulu-Natal and then moving to Cape Town, Johannesburg and all the small towns, etc. If you think of that as South Africa's Indian community, then you'd be wrong because there were Indians before the Indians. Okay? And if we look at the historical records of this country, in fact, right from the 17th century, there were Indian slaves in Dutch Cape Town. The East Indies were made up of not just what is today Malaysia, Indonesia, and so on, but also coastal parts of India, both the southwest coast, so-called Coromandel coast, that's actually a corru Portuguese corruption of an Indian word, or the south uh, western coast, southeast and southwestern coast, the so-called Malabar coast, okay, where the Portuguese were active, and the Dutch, as we shall see. There were Dutch factories in India in the 17th century. So coastal India was also part of the East Indies. And so when, ironically, the Dutch decided to stock up on slaves in Africa and brought them from the east into Africa, the researches of the likes of Nigel Worden at UCT show that probably one-third of the slaves were of Indian origin. That uh, kind of knowledge of Indianness gradually dissipated and got lost, but in the early period, the Dutch frequently referred to their slaves and gave them the patronyms of fun somewhere from a certain place. And there was often names like Ari van Bengalen, Ari from Bengal, Ari from Ceylon, and so on and so forth. In fact, some of those slaves played enormously important roles as interpreters because they were smart. They learned Afrikaans, stroke Dutch early on, and sometimes they ran away from the Cape into the interior and learned Klossa quite well. In fact, the first 
translation between the first missionary from Europe to meet a Khalsa chieftain in the Eastern Cape was a Bengali slave. All right. Now, I don't have time to go into the details of that, but I have written about that somewhere. Now, what would have happened was that, of course, uh, slave culture, as it evolved in Cape Town, as elsewhere, would have been very much a melting pot uh, effect under very oppressive conditions. And uh, in fact, there were two outlets eventually. Slaves, if they converted to Christianity, would then be freed. And so many became Christians and would today be considered part of the colored ethos of Cape Town. Others re stubbornly refused that route to freedom and retained their Islamic uh, religion. And if there were Hindus amongst the slaves, and there must have been more than a few, they would have had a choice of converting to Islam, closer to their culture, or to uh, Christianity. Not enough has been done about the Bengali slaves and the uh, Sri Lankan slaves and so on, but as a linguist, I would like to think, without being a specialist in Afrikaans by any means, I'm a KZN person, uh, fundamentally, there are some words in Afrikaans that I'm dead certain are coinages by Indian slaves of three centuries ago. In this city, no one says roti, everyone says ruti, all right? And that is the way a Bengali slave would have pronounced it. The raising of the O vowel to U is unknown. In Malay, uh, in the East, uh, the word is roti as a borrowing from Hindi, etc. But ruti is probably a Bengali pronunciation. Then there's an Afrikaans word. I don't know if it's still used, but I've seen it in some books. Chup still, meaning be quiet. You yutsa there, be chup still, please. And the still is from Afrikaans, but the chup is certainly an Indian word, means be quiet. Okay, so that's an Afrikaans word. And then there's nachi, which is a kind of Mandarin orange. Citron, Nachi. <clears throat> um, no one knew the origins of the word, um, and I always dig around, and it took me a few years when I discovered that the way the Tamil is spoken in Sri Lanka, the word is Narthai. Narthai, and Guru Krishna out here who knows Tamil probably doesn't say it that way in Madras, but I'm assured, and I've checked this out with some citizens of that fair island, that Naratai is the word. So Naratai would have been given a diminutive suffix between a small knot. So Nachi is nothing but a small knot. But what's a knot? Well, this is really like Aranji, right? Aranji from Persia, Arabic, Hindi, etc., etc. Okay, so little glimpses of an Indian past in Cape Town. However, my talk in the 40 minutes I have left, Midi, I hope, uh, will be on the, uh, the post-slavery Indian influences in South Africa. Okay, so I'm going to be talking today about some old research that I conducted years ago in KwaZulu-Natal uh, amongst descendants of people on the sugarcane plantations, and I looked at the languages that they spoke. So I'll give you a refresher on that old research for about 10 minutes. Some of you would have heard some of this before and some of the slides may seem a little familiar. <clears throat> but then I will talk about new research that I've undertaken with my Indian colleagues uh, more recently. That is very much work in progress, but it is very interesting research, I must say. Cape Town continues to offer and throw up numerous surprises for sociolinguistics. So, this is a map of India, um, and I got that from the wiki in 2010, and I rather like this one because it gives you the different states of India, but it writes the name of the state in the script uh, associated with the language there. And so you can see that the script for <coughs> Rajasthan is similar to the one for Maharashtra, but different from the one for Gujarat, different from the one for Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, and different from the one for Uriya, Orissa rather, etc. Okay, and certainly very different from the northeast, sorry, northwest frontier states, Pakistan, uh, Kashmir, and so on, which use the Perso-Arabic script. All right. Now, I'm not trying to be opaque, but just to remind us that English is really one window into the world and frequently a misleading window in the world. If you see the world through non-English eyes, it looks different 
and frankly more interesting. <laughs> okay, but let's do the easy thing. So here's a more modern map that I got again from uh, the internet. This is more modern. It actually shows you a state like Andhra Pradesh breaking up into two Telangana. So my stories are going to be about the many states of India, but in particular the ones which sent laborers or which sent traders and people trying out their luck in Cape Town and KZN, etc. So it will be the story is largely about Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana today, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, uh, Gujarat, Maharashtra. And there are many languages in India, anything from 400 to 800, depending who's counting and how you count and what is a language. All right? As a linguist, we say it's very hard to say what's a language. All right? Remember, we don't take written things seriously. Written things represent something that's live and in flux and changing and adapting and coming into contact constantly with other entities that we think of as language. But here are some of the main languages of India. This list is not, in fact, entirely accurate. There's no language called Bihari, although it's nice to think of it as a Bihar kind of Hindi. All right? Actually, this would have been what we're going to be calling Bhojpuri later today. So um, Indian history in KwaZulu-Natal begins in 1860 when the first ships brought indentured laborers and for 15 years uh, only uh, laborers existed in the Indian segment of KZN. Natal colony as it was. Passenger Indians who paid their own passage, that's what it means, paid uh, and came on the same ships um, or on different ships sometimes, but they paid the passage. They didn't come as indentured workers, indentured workers on fixed contracts. They came as relatively free, but most often menial workers. Many Stunningly rich Indians today have stunningly poor backgrounds in the 19th century as real menial workers. Some of them are referred to as donkey men working in mills and so on. Although I've since discovered that donkey man is not necessarily a bad term in shipping jargon. Okay, but really people, Indians worked in Cape Town as stone breakers and you know, road menders and things like that in the early days. But there's always a historical distinction which somewhat remains today between people whose ancestry is of indentured workers, whose, whose grandparents, great-grandparents labored on the, in fact, not just labored, but established the sugar plantations of Natal, versus the passenger Indians who were never indentured. Something of a class distinction in South Africa today but it, which is one which is being eroded by things like education and class and things like that. So uh, this is a familiar slide of uh, Indians in the 1860s arriving in the port of Durban. This is what they looked like. They would have been called coolies, meaning oriental worker, but it soon became a derogatory term. <clears throat> and they labored in the sugarcane plantations and the women also worked on the sugarcane plantations from sun up to sundown. And here, this is on the north coast. Uh, this is a tea and coffee plantation. And yes, the, the plantations were not just of sugarcane, but of uh, cotton, coffee, and tea. And I assume that, not, that the indentured women working in the fields were not always as happy as this. OK, now. We're talking about language, okay? So indentured workers came from a wide belt from three different areas with different languages. One was this great Gangetic North Indian plain, roughly where Hindi is a dominant language, but many varieties, some languages are considered somewhat separate, called Bhojpuri, Audhi, Braj, and Hindi itself. So the Hindi belt is even wider than this, up to Delhi. From the south of India were Telugu speakers and Tamil speakers. <clears throat> so the indentured strand is out here, and they would have caught a ship from either Calcutta or from Madras and come to Natal, and it's a journey of about six weeks. Sh relatively short, if you were being shipped to the Caribbean, that was a long journey, and that was an co almost complete break with India. Whereas with Natal, you were just about at the margins of being able to 
um, go back at some stage and come and travel regularly. Okay, now the Gujarati uh, out here in this circle um, were not indentured, but they came as traders. Some were quite well off with international links even with uh, places like Mauritius and so forth, but the vast majority, as I've said, were menial workers. Missing in amongst these circles, this is an old slide of mine, are the following, and that is the story of Konkani is one that we've been doing more recently. And Konkani is a language of Cape Town. The average person in Durban, unless they have family in Cape Town, have never heard of Konkani. But this language is alive and well and robust. It has, in its heyday, about 30,000 fluent speakers. Now, familiar pattern, younger people are speaking the boring languages like English and Afrikaans. Although Afrikaans is not so boring when spoken by Konkani and other people on the Cape Flats. <laughs> Uh, so the Konkan coast is something I'm going to be talking about in great detail. But I want to, s for the f f first next five minutes, talk about the indentured history as a prelude to the very slightly different uh, research here on the sociolinguistics of Gujarati and Konkani. So <clears throat> turning to North India, this was really a very, very wide belt from which recruiters brought Indians to uh, work in the plantations, okay? This is closer to Bengal, and that is practically at the Punjab end of town, okay? So the languages, many languages in this belt, Maghi, Mathali, Bhojpuri, Audi, Pahari, Kariboli, Braj, Kanauji, Bundeli, Bagali. Some of the names may have changed today, okay? But these would have been closely related language. If you spoke these at a pinch, you could be understood. More than a pinch, you could be understood. More than that, when you speak to a stranger, you upgrade the way you speak. You speak more carefully. So there, this was a continuum of languages which are mutually intelligible. The amazing thing is, is a, with such a vast area of recruiting, if you look at the top, the darkest patches are from which most people came, Azamgarh, Basti, Gonda, Gorakhpur. But no more than 5% of the indentured laborers from the north came from here. So no area, no district sent more than 5%, if you like, of the total of the um, emigrating laborers. So what this means linguistically is that no one language or dialect uh, predominated when people came to uh, dock in Durban they would have gradually, after overcoming the surprise in this speech, the, the vast variety of speech forms around them, over decades started to accommodate to each other's norms. And within a generation, a new form of Natali Hindi, Natal Hindi, what I've called South African Bhojpuri, emerged. And I've preferred to call it Bhojpuri because Bhojpuri is unambiguously the language of Mauritius, okay? So the British sent laborers first to Mauritius, and they recruited out here, and then they sent people to South America, British Guyana and Trinidad, then to Natal, and then to Fiji. So if you look at the Fiji variety of Hindi, it's closer to this lot. If you look at Bhojpuri of Mauritius, it's closer to this lot, and in Natal, we're somewhat in the middle. Okay, so there's a historicity here. I'm not going to go into this detail. There's a whole book written on it by yours truly in 1992, where I talk about every possible construction in the language in Natal as ordinary people speak, and then to see where it comes from. And that was a historical challenge, and it's a wonderful challenge. And no priest or educated people was impressed by the work because they said, this is all broken kitchen stuff. Why bother with it? Doesn't he have anything better to do? That's what one of my interviews asked, OK? Doesn't he have anything better to do? Because the priests say, this is all bad language. Only Hindi counts. Proper Hindi as promulgated in education and the priest and so on. Now, I don't contest that it's good to know good Hindi and to write it and so on, not a problem. But as I say, there's no real significant history about it. It's all the same, whereas history abounds in all of the uh, changes that have been made to the languages to coalesce to one common form in Natal. 
This common form would have accepted words from English too and disguised them. So a word like pilak is actually a word for piece of wood from plank. It would have accepted a few words from Zulu and it would even have given some words to Zulu. So the word in the 19th century for uh, uh, kana kana was uh, actually known in Zulu and it meant not just food. In Bhujpur it means eat the food or have some food. Kana kana got known to Zulus but they used it in their language to mean rich and spicy food. Okay? <laughs> so, um, so the story here is really uh, coalescence and one uniform, more or less uniform, variety emerging in 19th century Natal. It's now in great decline. Young people don't speak this anymore. But for two generations, South African Bhojpuri was alive and well. Now, just to give you a point, very similar things happened in the other colonies to which Indians were said. This is a grammar of Fiji Hindi, and Fiji Hindi is a bit more Western than the South African variety. Uh, this is a cover of a book that I am one of the few owners left on the planet because in Fiji the priests are very prominent and very strong and they run the educational show and when this uh, American Rodney Moog, a blind linguist with the um, Peace Corps, wrote this book, they said, what is all this rubbish? This is, you know, ulta pulta, upside down language. We must only teach Hindi and there was a public mass burning of this humble book on Fiji Hindi, all right. Fortunately, in Natal, no one cared enough to burn my PhD or the <laughs> book that emerged out of it. So in a way, being a sociolinguist does mean being proactive. It's not just collecting butterflies. We are crazy about suffixes and tense and aspect and all of that stuff, but it's not only collecting butterflies. It does connect with the real concerns of real people and the oppressions they face, not only from colonists, but sometimes from within. Right, so you're going to see this map many times. I won't have anything to say about Telugu for reasons of time, but the Telugu story is frankly quite similar to the story for Tamil. Tamil is interesting in Natal because it's the majority, has a majority number of speakers in no other colony well, except Malaysia, did Tamils predominate amongst Indians. In most of the colonies, it was Bhojpuri. In fact, Bhojpuri is virtually the official language of Mauritius. In Mauritius, the population demographics are such that about 60% are Indians, and there, ergo, they are in power, etc. And if you're in power, you decide which is the official language of your country, etc. And in Mauritius, it is French, English, Hindi, and Bhojpuri. Okay, and the notes, the rupee notes also have many languages, Tamil as well on the rupee, Mauritian rupee, Tamil, uh, Marathi, Hindi, uh, not Bhojpuri but Hindi because that's kind of more official for a note. And then when they changed the rupee note in Mauritius, there was a big to-do because they demoted Tamil to third position instead of uh, Hindi, etc. And that was the, you know, the fight of the month the last time I was in Mauritius. Okay, so Tamil it has a majority in South Africa and it too has a rich plantation experience. I've documented things like what are new words that people used in the languages when they came across new people, new customs, new animals, uh, new concepts, new types of food, etc. And again, that's old research, so I won't have time to go into it. However, as a dialectologist, I was very interested to find out whether <clears throat> Tamil coalesced to form one variety the way Bhojpuri did or what had happened. Did people continue speaking the way they did? So I did some historical research and I found that uh, this is not a great map and I think it's not quite done to scale. I got it from the historian Suresh Bana. Uh, but there's a northern dialect area for Tamil northern dialect, Madras out there, North Arkut, South Arkut. There's a western dialect, an eastern dialect, Tanjur, and a southern dialect, Tinnaveli, and so on. In uh, Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan Tamil is closest to the south, and this is because people migrated from the south easily to Sri Lanka. 
The Malaysian one, I'm not 100% sure because no one's crazy enough to do research on Tamil and other languages in Malaysia. They're all making money. They're not linguists, sociolinguists. But I gather that the, uh, because the migration pattern to Malaysia is this way, it's likely to have a mix of features but with the Eastern dialect predominating. Well, in South Africa, uh, I did some research without really being... Uh, really knowledgeable in Tamil, but I got the services of my old Latin teacher, Mr. Bhavanathan Pillay, who speaks Tamil fluently and Latin. He used to write me letters in Latin when I was in high school. Uh, and we did some research. He did the interviews. I found the literature describing the different dialects in India. And I said, OK, these are the features. Let's test them in ordinary speech, which ones exist. And it looks like wherever there are dialect forms, none of the dialect forms made it to Natal except the northern dialects. So, in fact, this makes a great deal of sense because 85% of migrating uh, people from Tamil Nadu came from the north and not Arkat is what it's pronounced as, A-R-C-O-T, not Arkat, in fact. Uh, dialect is very similar to Natal according to the dialect descriptions, all right? So where there are diagnostic forms, here are some forms. Uh, Kaludai for an ass or donkey. When I was growing up in Natal, I knew the form Kaida. I knew, I couldn't speak Tamil, I couldn't understand a lot of it, but I knew all the swear words and the interesting <laughs> words like ass and old woman and so on. Kilavi, general educated Tamil of India, but KV here in North Arkut and KZ. And Koli for hen koi. Manjal with a retroflex L at there, manja for yellow, the color. Chilies, milakai, molaga, right? So in, in diagnostic forms like this, and I have pages and pages of diagnostic forms, not just vocabulary items, but suffixes and tenses and all that. KZN looks surprisingly like North Arcot district of the lower stratum of society. And that pleases me a great deal, all right, that we have a history of that in KZN. One has to be careful. Uh, Guru Krishna is a very gentle Tamil priest here, and he's unlikely to assault me. But when I gave this talk in the Caribbean, I was almost assaulted by a Tamil Brahmin scholar from India, but working in Pennsylvania. And for the rest of the conference, he mocked the low-class Tamil that Mistri's talk was all about. Okay? My talk had lots of slides. So this pure idea of purism is very strong in parts of India, and Tamil, rightly, uh, Tamil people are rightly proud of their language. Uh, it's an old language that goes back to over 2,000 years. It's somewhat a classical language in some ways, and that's the form that's taught when you want to get an education and make a formal speech. You speak in the old classical style. The modern, ordinary, colloquial style is not taken seriously at all. And for it to be put on a PowerPoint nochal in Cape Town at university is a shock. All right. So uh, I'll have to deal with this person because he's editing the volume in which my article is to appear. OK, so that's a brief. Uh, lots can be said about Tamil. And I have a paper or two that might prove interesting to people. Now, we go to the languages, not of the indentured, but of uh, trading class people. And here, I'm going to focus for five or 10 minutes on Konkani. Konkani is so pronounced in India, but in South Africa, it's actually pronounced Kokni. Right? That's very different from Kokni. That's a different vowel, Kokni. And uh, this means a language of the Konkan coast, right? This is the coastal area south of Mumbai, <clears throat> but ending somewhere out here. We'll see a more detailed map shortly of the Konkan coast. And many people settled directly in Cape Town from the Konkan coast. These are people well used to the uh, traveling by boat and so on, and the connections with Africa are reasonably strong. And so people don't generally have an experience of KZN if they come from the Konkan, right? Whereas Tamil people in Cape Town almost invariably first have an ancestor who labored in Natal before coming over to try their fortune in Cape Town. So this is the Konkan 
post. This is Sonal Kulkarni Joshi's slide of some of the districts uh, and villages. So it's a long belt. It's not a wide belt, but it's a long belt. Maharashtra, famous uh, village and district names are Ked, Chiplun, Ratnagiri, from which most Kokni speakers in Cape Town come from, and still others, okay? So a wide belt, and these people uh, are quite used to migrating for centuries uh, in search of better opportunities. The interesting thing is, is that the migrants to Cape Town are entirely Muslim, all right? It, the ones who migrated to East Africa are entirely Christian, coming from Goa, which was a Portuguese enclave. Uh, Konkni doesn't have very high uh, standing here. It is Marathi, which is more the official language, and for a long time Konkni was considered a dialect of Marathi. But after Goan independence in the 1990s, it has the status of being a state language and it is certainly looks like it is growing in status and numbers in Goa whereas in the rest of the Konkan coast um, Konkani plays second fiddle to Marathi and Urdu and now English. We did some field work uh, in the Konkan coast, this is Professor Kulkarni, her PhD student Rutha, and that is me looking very relaxed, I must say, for a field worker. Uh, right, and so what we've done is visited some of the villages from which we know that people had come. So initially we did interviews in Cape Town. We, our work is not entirely original. There's a brilliant historian at UWC who did work on Konkni and whose work we drew on. Her name is Uma Mestri. Uh, and so we drew on a historical work and followed up linguistically. And we wanted to double check some of these things at first hand. The connection between Cape Town and the Konkan coast is astounding. Everyone knows of the Afrika Wale, right? The Afrika Wale are the ones from Africa, that's what they are called. Although behind their backs they are called the Paise Wale. Paise Wale, the ones with money, okay? Uh, now, one has to admire the local Kokni community for plowing quite a bit back into their villages. This is a school built with money from Cape Town mostly, although there might have been help from elsewhere. And this is in a village called Morba, a school that we visited. And there are signs of Cape Town everywhere in the village and in the school. There are plaques. And this one is uh, next to a mosque, a waterworks, water well established by the Gangarake family who live in Athlone, Cape Town. All right. And so what I admire is that people have done good works. It's not throwing money at uh, their ancestors, but actually engaging in things that will develop the communities, schools, waterworks, and something else I'll show you now. This is a list of the uh, students who've come first in the school from the 1950s. And this, I took this because this is so Cape Townian, I can't believe it. Some of you might have taught people with names like Capri, although I'm not sure that the Capri's do that well at school, Danse, <laughs> Rawut, uh, you might have gone to Rajburg, Bandeker, okay, uh, and so on, Haneker, Gangreker, and these are, uh, this could be a sort of who's who of parts of Athlone, Cape Town, actually. Notice that in 1978, a mystery came first in the examination, too, okay? <laughs> And even a spelling like Rawut, I just thought it's bad spelling. They're influenced by Afrikaans, don't know how to spell it properly. But that spelling exists on the Konkan coast, so that was quite chastening for me. Here's a building built with Cape Town money. And the idea is this. Uh, we put up the money, you put up the labor, you build this building, make it a commercial center for the town, collect the rent, and plow the rent profits from the rent into the social projects there. So I was very impressed by that as well. And this is a very Cockney style of color and architecture. Here's another house. And this is likely to be a house built by someone who has at least one relative who's traveled abroad, possibly Cape Town. You have a better home from the very ordinary huts and hovels otherwise. Today, 
the word on the street is Cape Town's no good, it's saturated, not entirely safe, etc. The place to go to for migrants is now the Middle East. All right? But the Cape Town Wallers have a reputation of supporting their home villages to a much, much greater extent than the new workers who are going to the Middle East. Okay? You may also say, but isn't this, you know, well, isn't this not good for South Africa that people are investing in the home villages? Well, one must say that Konkanis have contributed enormously to Cape Town in the early days by their labor, subsequently by their trading skills, and now by their education uh, and so forth. So people like Sally Mauser were once the CEO of the city, uh, and there are other people like Judge Siraj Desai and so on and so on. More than that, uh, the Konkanis in Cape Town were great fundraisers for the liberation movement here. And I know that I did some political work with my Konkani friends in the past, and I can tell you um, that the ANC relied heavily on the Konkanis of Cape Town for fundraising until about 2003 when they suddenly stopped needing local money, and I suspect it's something to do with something called the arms deal subsequently. Okay? So, okay. Uh, Here's a place that I got excited about when a golden dish restaurant in the Konkan, right? And usually we borrow names from India, Mumbai Cafe, Delhi, whatever, etc. But it works both ways too. Golden dish is a place where you get fast food, cheap fast food, reasonably good in Athlone and someone took this back. It's not the same family, someone else took the concept uh, back to the Konkan. <clears throat> then we went to uh, Nazira's uh, uncle's uh, village called Latvan, and here's Ruta Paratka with Ralf Chafakar, and here's a school built with Cape Town money. Uh, after a good day's field work, you need sustenance, and I purely accepted the meal because I wanted to know what a home cooked Konkan meal is like. And I can tell you it's jolly good, entirely vegetarian, and this was novelty to me. This is kaju curry, cashew nut curry and I highly recommend it, all right? We can start a restaurant, cashew nut curry, amazing. And then I heard, well, all the Konkanis cook it in Cape Town, and I never knew. I went to India to discover that my neighbors cook cashew nut curry. There's a map of South Africa in Urdu in the uh, classroom at Latvan, and there's no map of India, all right? So South Africa features quite strongly in Latvan. So in South Africa, we've done work on 21 villages of origin. And when I say we, I mean mainly other people, of course. Sonal Kulkarni and Estun Ruta have interviewed people from 20 villages. And the village identities are still strong 125 years on. When people gather in Cape Town, I mean, they gather as a community, but there's a certain friendly rivalry about which village you come from. Okay? So they're strong village identities, and we are studying whether there are linguistic ramifications for these strong village identities, all right? So are there still distinct dialects today? Or has there been a kind of coalescence the way there was in Natal for no towards no particular variety, but a new Natal variety for North Indian Hindi speech, or towards one dominant historical dialect of the migrants? And we're still um, studying this. Uh, when I say um, there's a strong sense of village uh, identity, here's one society, this is a village, the Sakral Society sponsored this show, okay? Um, and here's a book that was produced by the community, A Heritage of Inspiration, A History of the Konkan Coast, Urdu, Konkan Language, and an uh, inkling of all the villages and so forth. And it looks like there is a strong retention of a village variety. And so far, the Latvan variety looks quite uh, prominent. It has a double dative, which is unusual for Marathi. So, Kerukala means to do something for someone. But the form Kala would translate as for, uh, and it's a double dative form. Uh, and in this way, Latvan in Cape Town is different from the other varieties. If you want to hear what Konkani sounds like, 
Uh, here's a proverb from Dr. Mahate, who's in the audience. We now have the sound working, Dr. Mahate, so you don't have to repeat this. Here's a proverb, and proverbs are still running strong in Cape Town. Now, there's one that is used in Marathi also, but in Kokni, like familiarity breeds contempt. The Kokni proverbs was, Laam ashe sapni dishe, zagol ashe kapali vashe. Laam ashe, anything that's far, you dream of it. Any that's come near to you, gives you a headache. So thank you very much for that uh, wonderful exposition and an uh, opportunity to hear what local Kokani sounds like. That's also the Latvan Dabad variety, I gather. Okay, back to my map. So now uh, that was just a taste of Konkani, and really I have lots and lots of slides and I could spend the evening talking about some of these things, but let's go on to the last language for the evening. Mede, I think I'm doing okay for the last language, and that is Gujarati, all right? So uh, Gujarati is a language spoken in Gujarat. There would be many other languages spoken to it, some closely related, some not. And let's get back to our map to remind ourselves that Gujarat is out here. And you can see it's lots of ocean, right? Arabian Sea, the Gulf of Kutch, and so on. So these are seasoned travelers like the Konkans on the coast here, okay? Seasoned travelers. In fact, Professor Kulkarni in Pune is tracking how people left different villages by what means. She's interested whether they went by road to Mumbai and then, uh, uh, caught a boat or when they did they leave directly by boat or go by boat to Mumbai, etc. These are interesting travel routes. Okay, so that's where Gujarat is. And um, this is what it looks like in detail, a modern map of Gujarat. So this is the Surat area and this is the Katyawad area. These are two broad dialects of Gujarati. The standard is out here around Ahmedabad where the Chavdas come from and there are northern varieties as well. There are still other languages which influence varieties of Gujarati as well. Gandhi, as you probably know, came from Port Bandar, so this is the Katyawad, Katyawad <laughs> uh, area, and this is Surat. The name Surat is well known. Uh, I think Surti Richards must get the name from Surat. Surti means citizen of Surat, all right? And in the 19th century, Cape Townians of a colonial and other persuasion did not say very favorable things about the Surtis. Okay? Surtis were alleged to be not so clean and not so careful about hygiene and so on, but you know, those are probably colonial myths. In fact, as soon as people got steady jobs and earned a living, they became models really of hygiene, health, cleanliness, etc., uh, etc. Et so, um, this research is going to be interesting. In Cape Town, most of the Gujarati community are, would be from Navsari, Surat, Valsad, maybe one or two other areas, a few from the Katyawad, a few from Ahmedabad, but this is the predominant area, and we are starting the research to examine what's going to happen here. We can say, has the variety become more standard over time as people go back to India and speak mainly to Indian people? Um, this is what's happening with Konkani, by the way. You speak Konkani, more likely to speak Konkani to people in India when you visit than to younger people in your family. So this is why the village kind of, the villageness of the varieties uh, seems to remain in robust ways much more than in KwaZulu-Natal. Okay, and of course, uh, with Gandhi running Indian opinion, called a newspaper from 1903 to the 60s when his son took over, Manilal. But it wasn't really a newspaper, it was more like a journal. He didn't re bother to report things that were happening. It was an accident in the street, didn't make it in the paper. If it was important politically and culturally and for uplift of people, that's when things happened. So here's the front page of Indian opinion. It was a multilingual newspaper in English, Gujarati. Tamil and Hindi, but the Tamil and Hindi didn't last too long because not many subscribers from those communities and for uh, reasons of cost uh, that had to change. So it here's uh, the front page, women's place in our life uh, and the uh, corresponding text in Gujarati. Uh, let's see if I can 
hone in on that. So this is apna jivanma strinu sthan, right? Very badly read, and I'm sure Brunal is having a giggle at my Gujarati there. But at least I can read two scripts, huh? Okay, woman's place. More importantly, Gandhi wrote political tracts in uh, his lifetime in Joburg and especially Durban. Hind Swaraj was written on the boat from Southampton to Cape Town in 1909. And Hind Swaraj was a series of short articles which were first published in Gujarati in the Indian Opinion in Durban later compiled as a little booklet, and it means self-rule for India, and it's the first inkling that he's thinking about independence, and this is widely described as the first anti-colonial text. In fact, there were anti-colonial movements centuries before that in South America and so on, but for the British ethos, Hind Swaraj is our book written on boat to our fair city. Okay, so I've challenged the Chavdas who read Gujarati very well and know the language inside out and whose daughter at the back there is a perfect speaker of Gujarati and reads and writes it, etc. Uh, I want to know maybe we can make a case that would Gandhi's political consciousness coming to being in Natal and him writing politics for the first time in Natal, maybe... Natal can be said to be the place where the genre of Gujarati political prose was born. I stress maybe because we have to prove it, and that would be rather neat, all right, to say that we have a place historically not just in politics but in linguistics too. And so uh, if there are rich sponsors out in the audience, I'm paying the Chavdas for this year for their postdoctoral stint in Cape Town. So Mehdi, perhaps if we can take the hat around after this. We want to keep the Chavdas here for another two years, okay? And they are studying things like, it's not just Gandhi, like I said, we're not just into great men and things like that. We don't take great men that seriously anymore. But ordinary people, the Diwali magazine for years published in India for Cape Town, right? and has writings in English but also in Gujarati. So Murnal, the literary and cultural scholar, is looking at local writings. Um, we haven't come across a Shakespeare yet, but we have come across some pretty decent short, short stories and poetry and things like that. Speaking of poetry, these, these are the collected 110 poems of Babur Bhai Chavda, written in Gujarati in Cape Town. He passed away some years ago, and I think we are going to be the first one to try and analyze this for its historical and literary merit. So Konkni is not generally written in Cape Town. When people want to write in the Indian mode, they go to um, Urdu and sometimes Arabic. Gujarati is a written language par excellence, partly thanks to Gandhi's 20 years in South Africa. So when you're doing Konkni, it's oral culture, proverbs. When you're doing Gujarati, it's both, but we also have a rich harvest of written materials. So this is what Babur Bhai Chavda's poem is like, and this is read by Mrunal, um, and we managed to resurrect the sound file so you don't have to uh, sing it out for us. So this is the introduction to the book of poems, and this is what it's like in the original. Garat Gami Vatan Maru Navsari Che Prant Talu Ko Gandevi Sundar Jillo Surat Shant Dada Mara Purshottam Te Haridas Nasut Mata Jivi Pita Daji Uchu Tenupur Mosare Mamane Aji Dam Ganatu Kos Janam Thayo Maro Mosare पिता गया परदे ख्रिस्ती साले चावड़ा वंशे उगली सोने साथ दिसंबर नी तारीक सत्तर मंगल सांजे आठ बार वर्षनी नानी वैमा विदेश पंथे पाथ केप टाउन मा मुकाम की तो पिता साथ संगात Okay, so I won't have time to go into this, but we're at an exploratory stage and uh, certainly issues of identity uh, and so on are, are quite um, interesting and will be followed up. There are some uh, linguistic uh, features that we find are slightly different and the Chavdas from Ahmedabad were struck by 
the pronunciation of the word Gujarati sometimes to be Gujarati and Itihas for history to be Itihas and not these are just two examples amongst many and sometimes the reverse happens where you expect a T you get a T so <coughs> excuse me standard Anguto Anguto and Kathiavadi to Kathiavadi uh, pertaining to Kathiavad district so these are just some of the uh, niceties and remember we don't say wrong bad etc we say how exciting something uh, intimate and local and what sense of history here and in fact it looks like uh, we've now going back to Grierson of the 19th century to look at his description of dialects in the Gujarat area and it looks like what some prescriptivists and priests might just say bad upside down language etc looks like venerable and traditional Surti language Surat language but this is something we're going to explore uh, in detail this year. So it's time to conclude. My last slide is that I've not talked about things like the difficulties of maintaining a language 150 years onwards. It's a struggle for people, but uh, there are many Indians in this country who love their language and culture whilst being firmly South Africans and giving everything that is expected of South Africans, like speaking English, learning an African language, uh, learning Afrikaans in the Cape, uh, paying your taxes, um, <laughs> and so on. So uh, here is, I thought I'd end up with Mr. Narayan Bakri, uh, speaker of Tamil, so proud of his language, and he's written three books to promote the Tamil language in KZN, and we wish him and others who are keen on promoting their language, not to the exclusion of anything. When anyone speaks...